What up, y'all? This is Ed Lover. How y'all doing, man? This is Come On Side, the podcast. Now, before we get to the podcast with my special guest today, there's a few things that have been laying on my mind that I need to get off my chest. I mean, things that make me say, Come on, son. Did y'all hear about this in Nyack, New York, in a middle school, or where I come from, we call it a junior high school. February 1st, y'all. Y'all know what February 1st is? The first day of Black History Month. These middle school children went into their cafeteria to have a regular lunch, and guess what they would serve? They would serve fried chicken. Chicken, 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 that's right. Waffles and watermelon. I beg your pardon? Come on, son. Who the fuck thought that this was a good idea to serve to these kids. And you know the majority of the school is black, right? So what do we do on Black History Month? We totally disrespect it by serving these kids fried chicken, watermelon, and waffles. Come on, son. First of all, y'all got to understand, black people like beef patties with cheese, okay? So where was the beef patties and cheese, huh? Why y'all fucked that up? Y'all didn't get that right. Y'all don't think we like lobster? Y'all don't think we like, like oysters or clams? Fried chicken, waffles, and watermelon? Come on, son. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. And speaking of bullshit, did y'all hear about this new thing? You can now get ticketed for having loud cars or your music too loud. Now, when I was coming up, we used to be ticketed because our systems was crazy in the car, right? We had the 215s or the 415s in the back, tweeted system, all that shit. We was riding, bow, bow. Cops used to pull you over. Come on, inside. Now they got the shit in the cameras. They always fucking with us. They're always fucking with us. It's in the cameras now. They got sound meters in the cameras. So if your car is too loud, if you got a messed up muffler or something like that, or your music is too loud, you can get an automatic ticket sent to you from the camera. Come on, inside. What happened to the good old police station that pull you over and harass you and tell you, Turn it down, and you'd be like, all right, and then as soon as you get a half a block away, you turn it right back up. Come on, son, now it's in the cameras. Suppose you got a loud-ass wife. Suppose your wife is, la- is yelling at you, and you driving. Do they pick that up? Do they send you a ticket for having a loud-ass wife? Come on, son, get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. And speaking of bullshit, y'all, Beyonce fans. <laughs> Come on, son. Are y'all that thirsty to see Beyonce that y'all starting GoFundMe pages? GoFundMe pages to see Beyonce? Come on, son. GoFundMe pages when somebody tragically gets killed that used to have all the money up to their ear on Instagram and you can't afford to pay for your funeral, so you come with a GoFundMe page. Come on, son. I'll be damned if I'm sending any one of you Beyonce fans any damn money on a GoFundMe for some tickets to see Beyonce. Come on, son. Them tickets are already as much as my damn mortgage. You got to be crazy. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Come on, son. I'm Ed Lover. Let's start the show. Come on, son, 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 son. <laughs> What up, y'all? Welcome to Come On, Son, the podcast. Oversaw, as usual, by the one and only Combat Jack. If this, this is actually my first show. This is usually all audio, but now we're going video because I thought it was only right for y'all to see, feel, smell, hear, do everything. I'm Ed Lover, in case y'all don't know who I am. We are celebrating the 50th year of hip-hop, so you should already know who I am and what I do and all the rest of that shit. If you don't know, I ain't got time. There's Wikipedia me or some shit. Let me tell y'all something. I'm Googleable. So Google me. Listen, my first guest on my first show, in my opinion, needs no introduction. As a guy that does stand-up comedy myself, I have always had a lot of respect for dudes that don't do anything else but stand-up. When you're able to make a living off of stand-up comedy and stand-up alone. Like, I still do radio. Like, I, I, I'm so scared to put myself out there just as a stand-up comedy. I still keep my podcast shit and my radio shit in case one day somebody boo me so bad I can never do this shit again. 
He is one of the original kings of comedy in New York City. He's known all over the country. He's hilarious, and I'm happy to say that I've known him for a long time. He's a friend of mine. Y'all give me a nice round for applause for Capone in the building Thank right you. now, man. Thank Everybody you. in the peanut gallery, y'all ain't clapping for Capone. What the fuck's wrong with y'all, son? Dude, we doing, we're doing this shit. Just because we're on camera don't mean I'll, everything I'm going to say is going to be on camera. What's up, my nigga? What's up, man? Paul, welcome, man. Welcome, Thank man. Thank you, man. You've been Thank doing you. this for a long time. Time That's and you are absolutely known as one of the best yeah. in the game. You are known as the gangster comedy. You got Team Capone. Right. How have you been able to maintain such a high standard of comedy over such a long period of time? Well, one of the things uh, I can honestly say is uh, being a person from the streets, uh, you always hear the top. Um, I'm, I'm gonna make it to the top. When you don't put a ceiling on your comedy or anything that you do in life, you keep going, you expand. See, a lot of people always use the expression of, I'm blowing up. You gotta blow out. It's, it's a thing where you have to understand that up is just one way. And you can always, once you feel that you're at the top, there's no way left to go. Well, when you blow out, you go every single place and you give it your best. And that's what I've been actually lived upon, to never ever just think that I made it to the top and always be at a point where I'm willing to learn something new. How long How long did it take you? I had a conversation with Chris Rock one uh -huh. time. Chris Rock, everybody knows, is a fantastic comedian, right? And we was doing this thing called Top 5. He had the movie out called Top 5. Right. So I kind of hung around after we finished doing it, and I asked him, I said, Chris, um, how long did it take you to get your voice? How long did it take you to find out who Capone was? Uh, right away. Really? Right away. And I say that because there was so much hate in the comedy game when I was coming in. People hated me for no reason because I was different. I was, I was a drug dealer, man, and I was from the streets. And uh, trying to make that transition over to become a comedian wasn't really accepted. And while it wasn't accepted, I got this reputation of being arrogant, being, you know, this dude. Because I, I spoke my, you know, my feelings, but mm -hmm. my feelings were actually getting hurt by just trying to fit in some place and, and do what I thought the protocol thing to do as a comedian. And, you know, from prison, you deal with real people coming to this, what I call the fake world of thugs or people who just was funny. It was totally different for me. And uh, I didn't fit in right away. I didn't know how to fit in, but I, I wanted to actually, because I knew I was funny and I knew I was talented, but at the same time, there was no room for fakeness. Where did it come from? Where did, where did your love for humor come from? Who did? Who, my, well, who did my grandmother always knew I was funny. Okay. Uh, from the time Will Smith had his first show, because I was in the music before this. Okay. And in, my, what, in what capacity? I was a rapper. Okay. Yeah, so uh, when Will Smith came out, my grandmother loved that show, and she used to say to me all the time, that, that should have been you. Because, you know, I was in the streets and I was doing whatever I was doing. And she was like, you're wasting your time out there. You're talented. That should have been you. Right. And finally it clicked, especially after coming home from prison. How long did you do? <laughs> I got sentenced to a one to three. Okay. And that was enough for me. A month was enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I always say this, and especially I say it on stage. You know, you go from making all that money and you get actually to a place where they pay you 40 cents a, a week and a honey bun is 50 cent, you gotta wait two weeks to get a honey bun. God that, damn. That, <laughs> Shit. Yeah, it's crazy, that will humble you. Yeah. So I was humbled very quick. And even in this business going through all of the stuff that I went through, it was a humbling experience all the way through and I still stay humble. And I tell my guys that roll with me, you know, that's the key, humbleness right. and not arrogant and do things with integrity. Yeah, did you? Did you find it, do you find it wild now because you were a street dude that made that move over to comedy? Do you find it weird now when you're looking at shit, you be like, dudes be getting locked up and then all of a sudden the snitch just jump oh, out there? Oh, yeah, of course. You know, when we say times change, they really change. Yeah. Um, but I listened to this guy, uh, with the 6 9 dude, uh -huh. about him snitching. And I hate to say it, he made a lot of sense when he talked about what they were doing to him. You know, the average person uh, from our area is not going, we're going to take it as it, they give it. Yeah. But they gave it to him. They slept with his girl. They did all kinds of stuff to him. <laughs> so I, I, I really can't blame him. Right. You know, I, I still live by the codes of the street, but I don't put myself in the position of having to snitch about anybody. I don't want to be around 
nobody that's negative. I always tell, I always tell everybody that everybody, all my friends, Capone. I was telling them, if y'all motherfuckers do something with me in the car, if we riding by, you see somebody you got beef with, you lean out that window and shoot them. Uh -huh. The next nigga you better shoot is me. Yeah. As soon as you drop me off, I'm telling. I'm telling. I didn't come out the house for murder. Exactly. I came out the house to go to get something to drink. I ain't come out here for murder. If you do murder, that's on you. I ain't got yeah, nothing to do with that. That's the truth. But I do understand the code of the streets of when you get into something. Right. You're supposed to know the, you know the circumstances behind yeah. this shit. You know there's a possibility that you can go to jail. Right. So if nobody is doing anything wrong to you, why would you sit up there and enjoy all of that company that you have and enjoy that life and then all of a sudden you turn around and you want to snitch on somebody? Yeah, I agree. The shit is fucked up, son. I agree. And I understand where you were coming from when you was talking about coming from where you came from, coming out of prison, being a drug dealer, jumping into comedy because you always knew you had it in you, the hate that you felt. Right. When you first came in, what the fuck is wrong with comedian, bro? I went through the same shit. You know I yes. went through the oh, same yes, shit. Oh yes, I do. Coming I do. off that radio, right? Hosting at Carolines, and then deciding. Thank you to people like yourself. Thank you to people like my cousin Talent. Thank right. you to Rip Michaels for telling me another fine comedian. Ed, you need to start doing stand up. Right. What the fuck is the hate for, bro? Um. And it's still there. Yeah, it is. It is, and that's. That's the insecurities of their self. A lot of, a lot of comedians are small-minded when they put themselves. They think that you're taking from them, you know. And I, it, it's, it's the best way that I can explain it is because it didn't just happen with our generation. Right. It happened before us, and a lot of people don't know that when we were coming up, the older comedians were hating on us because of Def Jam. Oh, if y'all didn't do Def Jam, y'all wouldn't have got the recognition that y'all got. But so what? Exactly. But that's going on now with the guys who are doing the internet. Our guys are hating on the guys doing the internet because we feel that we paved the way and now you got this camera that can make you do things. You know, even I was a little hated. I was hating a little bit right. because I didn't understand it. Okay. When you don't understand something, you kind of try to go the easy route. Oh, they not doing like us. But that's hard work. To get on that camera and try to make people laugh that's, every day, that's, that's right. work as well. And consistently do yes. shit? Yes, and you, you got to respect that. But are they funny? It, some of them are. Majority? Not majority, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> some of them some are. Some really got some good Yes, yes, I, I respect a lot of them, and okay. I, I've talked to a lot of them. And, uh, you know, like D.C. Youngfly, we under the same agent. Yeah, and shout out to D.C. Youngfly. Yeah, he, what up, kid? He's a... Uh, I love that dude, man. I just want to say this real quick because you just mentioned DC Young Fly. They had did a reboot earlier this year on Paramount Plus of Young TV Rats, right? So they went out and they did this big search. And not to take anything away from whoever they hired, I told them, go get 85 South. That's what I told them. Wow. Go get DC Young Fly in them because them cats, they could be self deprecating. They're not trying to be cooler than everybody right. else in the room. They're really good interviewers. I got a lot of respect for them. Yeah, They're I funny. Agree. I like them dudes yeah, right there. Very, very. Yeah, good and dude. Tell me about them. Team Capone, man. I've been hearing about Team Capone for a long time. I'm trying to figure out why the Ed Lover ain't on Team Capone. <laughs> <laughs> Tell well, me about Team Capone, fam. Um, it, it stemmed from the early days of hate. And uh, I, made a, I made a committed vow to myself that if I ever became successful, I will reach out to young brothers and give them an opportunity that I never got. And my thing is, I was put in a lot of great places because of my comedy. Like I was the, the crowd warmer for Steve Harvey. I was the crowd warmer for Monique in, um, in, uh, at the Apollo. Okay. And before I became the host of the Apollo, Whoopi Goldberg is the one who got me the job. Oh, wow. You know, um, a lot of people don't know that Susan DePass was my manager. Okay. And Susan DePass so, was a fucking executive producer on Who's the Man? Yes. Shout out Susan DePass. Yes. <laughs> Love her forever. Love Susan DePass. And so the when I started with Team Capone, it was just the Apollo gave me the opportunity to teach these young guys comedy finances. Because I always knew about money. Right. I always knew about timing. And nobody taught me how to have five minutes on set when you're doing a, a show right or like you know comic view and all of that or and nobody told me the money or the situations and so when i started teaching class i started teaching these young guys and then i decided that i wanted to do something with young guys because the old guys were kind of like bitter right and when you try to bring in 
a group of people. And the sad part to me, to be honest with you, I've helped out a lot. And the ones I helped out, they get a little bit and they feel like they made it. Right. And when you get that little bit and you feel like you made it, it was kind of hard for me. And so now I have a really, really solid team. Like the young brother, Brandon Reeves, he actually was the worst ever in my class. Really? When he started because of the fact that he didn't listen. <laughs> he didn't listen. You know, I would tell him how to host and be like, yo, just do it this way. Don't try to be funny. Bring your personality more when you're hosting. Right. And he tried to do the jokes, and it, you, it throw people off. It's a difference between hosting. Yes. Yeah. Oh very, my God. Yes. Oh boy. It's you, a very difference. <laughs> yes, sir. Don't I know that? It's a hell of a. If the, 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 for me, the biggest difference was as a host. When I step out on stage, it's not on me to be the funniest person. Right. Right. It's on me to make sure that the, the show flows exactly. smoothly. Exactly. Make sure people are having a good time. Introduce right. the next comedian. So, get, get my ass out the way. Even if somebody messed up. It's on you to bring the crowd back yeah, together. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. When somebody messed up, he messed Ooh, up. Oh, man. And it's going to sound like tumbleweeds in that motherfucker. Don't, you know how I tell him? I say, you know, you know you lost the whole crowd when you hear a motherfucker ordering a drink? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let me get a Hennessy. And you still telling jokes? Nah, I it's said, fry them shits hard, it's... all flats. You're like, oh, shit. Then you got to come right back out yes. and try to bring that crowd right back up? You're right. That's one of the hardest jobs to do. And then... But to me, the difference between being a featured comedian for me is hosted by Ed Lover to, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Ed, Ed Lover. Lover. Yeah. It's a Ooh. big difference. Yes, sir. It's a big difference. That's tough, bro. Yes. Just you and a fucking microphone. Yes. But uh, the thing is, dude, that you took it serious. And when you take it serious and people don't take you serious, that's a clash. Right. And that's what you have to understand. Nobody thought you would be successful. Just like T.I. Nobody thought T.I. Yeah. would be successful, but he took it serious. What do you think about Tip? I, I love Tip. I love him, man. And there was a time I, he tried to get on after me. Uh -huh. You know, he wanted to go on before me. And I said, nah, timing won't let that happen. No disrespect to him, right. but it was the timing of the show. Mm -hmm. And he understood. And, you know, we talked after it. But uh, I just, I respect anybody who takes it serious. Yeah, and he is taking it yes, seriously, Yes, exactly. Too. And he's helping out a lot of young brothers, too. Yeah, he's taking the and shit so seriously. I, I, I respect that a lot. And he understands what it means to fail. And you have to understand what it means to fail before right. you can grow. Exactly. And he didn't give up when he failed. Right. That's that's important to me. Yeah, he had to keep that shit going, man. Yes. And who do you, who, how did y'all start? And tell me why y'all started the New York Kings of Comedy. The New York Kings started with... Uh, each one of us guys, because we felt like we uh, we ran the city. Okay. I, I had the Bronx locked down. Talent pretty much had downtown, or you could say Midtown locked down. Rob Stapleton, he was another Bronx dude. And Gerald Kelly was just funny. Not that he had any rooms locked down, and at the time it was Drew. Drew was right. really heavy in Brooklyn. Yes, sir. Shout and out to so, Drew Fraser, y'all. Yes. So with that, we just came to an agreement. Hey, let's let's start touring together. Okay. And we got into a lot of flack, a lot of litigation with the name. Really? Yeah. From yeah. the original Kings of yeah. Comedy? Yeah. And then uh, I'll say it on tape, find out that that wasn't even there. Jerry Lewis is the owner <laughs> of the original Kings of Comedy. So, so the, <laughs> the yeah. Kings of Comedy are coming after y'all for saying the New York Kings of Comedy. Yes. And they ain't own the shit. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so we, uh, you know, we didn't expect it to blow up that big what right. we would go through. We were just guys who wanted to do shows together and make make some money. But right. it blew up. It blew up real big. And it kind of hurt us a little bit when the lawsuit started coming in because now you got me saying, well, I, I don't really want to go through no lawsuit. And, right. You know, you wouldn't think that the powers that be that was suing us would even go that route. But it did. And. We had to change the name, and uh, once we changed the name and went to court, uh, everything has been working out right. We ain't doing as many shows. We all got our own individual projects. Like, I really rock with my Team Capone guys right. because of the fact that these are young guys. And one thing about me, I respect loyalty. I respect hard work and loyalty, and that's what these guys have given me since day one. So I don't want to feel like we blowing up now and I turn my back on them. Right. Because I know that I am the draw, but once they see the show, they get the whole fan base. Gets You're the kind of dude love. to me that, that honestly believes that 
The show is only as good as every single person I that do. performs. I do. I do. I do. But I know, I mean, I mean, I take nothing from myself. I know my name carries the weight. Right. But I wouldn't have these guys on these type of shows. Like, we get shows. And I'm, I'm telling you, I fought. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I fought for their name. Like, hey, man, I don't know him. I, we, you know, who, yeah. why would you bring him? You know, just bring, or uh, I got a guy who don't know. If you don't have these guys on the show with me, I don't want to do the show. That's how serious they got. Okay. So even my agent was like, well, what is so important about these guys? Well, maybe I don't want my show to be messed up. I don't want people to just say, well, Capone was funny. Right. I want everybody to Absolutely. be funny. And that's what I get every show. I, every show that we've done so far, I promise you. And these guys have no names, no no. Tell everybody movies. who they are, man. Uh, Brandon Reeves is one. Brandon's sitting his ass over here yeah. right there. Put a, put a quick flash of that <laughs> motherfucker right there. I want, I want everybody yeah. to see that this is what we're about, man. Right. That's Brandon right there. And Kenny Wu. Everybody uh, know oh, how funny. Oh, I love Kenny Wu. That, he, oh. he was the first one down with me. Kenny is yeah. fucking stupid, y'all. Yeah. If you ever get an opportunity to check Kenny Wu out, <laughs> check him out. He's ridiculous. Yes. So much energy from that dude. Kenny Wu, uh, Adrian Carter. That's the big fat dude. Uh, I got a white guy named John and uh, Damien Razzo. He's half white and half black. And I get calls all the time uh -huh. for new guys, but I can't say that I feel the same energy about everybody that tries to get down. If I can help you, give you some advice, by all means, I know that that's my gift. I don't have a problem with that. Right. But to actually go on tour with me is very hard. I had a guy who I actually had on tour, and I'm not going to mention his name, young guy. Found out he was stealing jokes, but the dude actually said that I became jealous of him, and that's why I got rid of him. I found out he was stealing jokes, so I Still said, your hey, shit? "No, just jo every joke was somebody else's joke, oh, and he wow. changed it around." And so I was like, "Man, I, I really man, can't deal let's with talk this. about that for a minute, Capone, <laughs> shall we? Because that is really, really, <laughs> really crazy. Yeah, in comedy." I've had somebody steal my joke. I bought a joke. <laughs> right. I've actually gone and purchased a joke from Gerald Kelly's son, Isaiah. Right. Isaiah had a joke about the LOL, laugh out loud. Right. And I liked the joke, but I had something else I wanted to add to it, and I wanted to do the joke. So I went to Isaiah, and I said, Isaiah, I want to buy that joke from you. And he was like, bet. And he gave me a price, and I, I broke him off. So right. now it's my joke. But I have had a dude do my shit. With me in the audience. Oh, I've seen that. When I was time. on the show. Right. I was like, wait a minute. Nah, you know how they try to yeah. tell you, bro. <laughs> nah, I was thinking that shit. And I'm like, nah, nigga. Yeah. I just paid this nigga yeah. for the joke. <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow. Like, he's hosted. Right. Doing my shit. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, well, I've done. I've, I've been even called a joke thief. Who and called I, you a joke uh, thief? Come on, son. Well, I know. Get out of here. <laughs> fuck out of here with that bullshit. I done seen you a million times. What the fuck called you a well, joke thief? Well, the thing is, man, that when you think of something and, and you become successful, and people, I mean, my whole career, something already had something to say about me. Right. You know, when I first started, I used to have like a group of dancers with me. And uh, they was like, well, he ain't really that funny. He, he got an opinion on that Exactly. And then we moved to the next level where I become funny. But he only funny in New York. Then I go international. I, I've been to Africa. I've been everywhere. And it's still something that they have to say. Well, I, he probably stole that joke. Not even that I, I did. He probably did. Right. You know, or whatever. So I, I really learned to not let things get to me no more. And uh, I'm successful in this business. You're very successful. And I'm very business. happy. Kudos to you, my Thank brother. You, man. You're very Thank successful you. in this business. I I give you your props, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I I I admire you. Like I said at the top of the show, I admire comedians that that's all that they do for a living. Right. I've seen you throw your own shit. Yes, sir. It's very important. That I've you seen you it. throw your own shit at the Apollo Theater and sell that motherfucker out that, in New York City. And if anybody from out of town watching, if you've never been to New York, the Apollo is a staple in New York. Mm -hmm. It is tough as fuck to sell out the Apollo. Yes, you're right. I've seen you do it on more yes. than one occasion, Yes, brother. sir. And uh, I'm very happy about that because that was a challenge that I had to prove for myself. Right. You know, you can do a show and put an Ed Lover on the show, and you, you're going to sell a certain amount of tickets. I'm going to sell a certain amount of tickets, and whoever talent would put him on the show, he'll sell a certain amount. But that wasn't comfortable for me. Okay. I had to know why am I considered one of the kings in New York. And so I took it upon myself, put my own money up, and if I lose, I lose. But 
I didn't go into it losing or thinking I was going to lose. I just really had to prove to myself that I'm this funny that these people come out to see me. Right. Not just because I'm on a bill with you or the rest of the funny guys or a bunch of names that we put together. And so when I proved it to myself, my confidence became great to where now I can take on a bunch of young guys right. and bring them into the forum. Because believe it or not, as funny as they are, they're making it hard for me. And it, it's a challenge to actually see them do that work and then I got to go last and think that I'm, there's no half-stepping. Right. Go, I'm going straight in right. to show why I, I am who I am. And they'll tell you. Sometimes I get off stage and be like, they look at me and like, wow, you really had to go there? Yes, nigga. Yeah, y'all, y'all put fire yeah, under exactly. my ass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're fucking right. It's just the truth, man. Pull out all stops exactly. that night because y'all just brought, y'all heated the stage is on yes. fire. Yes, yes, What the, the fuck truth. am I supposed to do? Just let y'all ramshackle the that, shit out of me every night? That's the truth. No. Let me ask you a question, bro. As a comedian, sometimes it's hard to fall back, not to fall back on shit that was funny. Right. Right? Like when... Kev Hart, let's take him for example. Love Kev Hart. When Kev first came for his first thing, everybody was on it. It was crazy. Then the second thing, everybody was on it. It was crazy. By the time he got to the third special, I remember being in a in a in a room on uh what's this shit thing? Uh, uh Clubhouse. Right. And the room was called Is Kevin Hart Still Funny? Mm-hmm. And then he actually jumped in the room, but that's a whole nother <laughs> story altogether. But how hard is it to stay fresh, stay on top of material? Because you know you got shit that's funny. Right. How hard is it not to say, I'm going to do this shit again? You know what's really hard? When people come to see you and you got a whole new line of jokes, but they want to hear your old stuff. Right. The one thing I learned that I write classics. My jokes are classics and, you know, the Chinese man and people request my stuff like it's an album. Right. You know, you you doing... (laughs) Do the Chinese shit. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And so I, I learned that because, you know, people will be like, well, I heard that joke before. You got millions of people who have not seen you. Right. And I'll tell you one story, and I'll make it real quick, that really humbled me. I was on the Shaq tour, killing. I went from the first person to the headliner immediately. Right. And Shout I knew, Shaq. yes, sir. Shaq, that's my guy. He hit me up the other day. Now, I'm going to say this. Shaq, come do my goddamn podcast, <laughs> you big motherfucker. All right. So... The craziest part is now I'm killing. I'm I'm killing. So this particular day, I decided to wear a shiny suit because I'm feeling like Puffy and Mace. You know how they <laughs> used to dress? So I put on a shiny suit, and we in Memphis. And I'm, you know, I've been on Shaq. I've been on Def Jam. I'm, the, 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 everything is successful. I come out on stage ready to rock. I'm the last person. And so... The crowd is dying laughing. Ah, so I'm taking it in like they loving me. Right. But the laughter went on a little longer than usual. <laughs> so now I'm like, what the fuck? Wait a minute. What's, what's going on here? And I said, are y'all laughing? I said it on the mic. I said, are y'all laughing at me? And somebody said, we laughing at that bullshit suit. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So I didn't, I tell you, I didn't know how to take it, but I, when I say I went in, I went in and I, I got a standing ovation. I'll never forget this. I got a standing ovation. Me and Gary Owens were selling DVDs after the show. And uh, I had a whole line. Gary had a whole line. We was the only two selling DVDs. And I say out of 200 people, 180 of them was like, yo, I ain't never heard of you, dude, but you were probably the funniest man I ever seen. Right. And that sh- shocked me. I was like, you never what? He said, I never heard of you, dude. And they were, you know, Memphis, they different. They dress with, the women have a mouth full of gold teeth. Yeah, absolutely. But it humbled me. because Rest in peace, gangsta boo, matter of fact. I thought that I was that dude that everybody should know. I rocked Def Jam. I got a standing ovation twice on Def Jam. Right. You know, everything I did, I did well, but people don't know you. And when they do finally see you and see you live, it's a total different story. So I, from that point on, I never went to any show expecting like I'm this, that guy. It's always been a humble entrance and just do what I got to do right. and see if they love me from there. And what, did, what, did, what did Def Jam mean to comedians like you? Y'all uh-huh. did Def Jam, the heyday of Def Jam. Right. I hosted Def Jam when they moved to L.A. Right. Wasn't the same shit. Right. Um, what it meant to me 
and I'm being a hundred percent honest with you, it meant more to me than I can express because I was in prison the first time I was supposed to tape. Oh wow! Yes. Okay. So I got I got the the note that I was getting ready to go, and uh, I got uh, locked up, and uh, the opportunity didn't come back for me until they redid it. Okay. And when they redid it, I uh, I got a standing ovation. I ripped. And they called me back the next year okay. to do it again, and the same thing happened. And so even that, with all of that behind you and under your belt, you know, generations change. Yeah. And so to answer your question, I change with the generations. I got these young guys who are going to be old soon, but I'm able to put myself in a position to where I can teach them and they can teach me. Because when you feel like you're too old to learn, or you know it all, you, you, that's where you stop at. Top three favorite comedians of all time. George, not, you can't include no, no yourself. Sir. All right. All right. <sighs> Eddie Murphy. Okay. George Carlin. Okay. And Richard Pryor. Why George Carlin? Because George Carlin was a genius with words. And he was very, very social conscious. Yeah, he was. Very social conscious. And he taught you. And that's... One of the things that I try to bring in within my comedy. Uh -huh. I try to be funny. I don't try to offend anybody. But, you know, nowadays we know you could just say boo. How you, how, you, how you navigating around that? Because uh, I, like, I feel like Chappelle fell on the knife for us. I feel like Chappelle made it like, you know what? Leave fucking comedy alone. Right. And I'm going to take this hit, whatever the fuck the hit is. Y'all can't cancel me because I got too much goddamn right. money. And mm -hmm. I'm still going to tour, right? <laughs> so y'all can't cancel me. Right. But I'll be like... Y'all say cancel Ed Lover. I'll be agreed at Walmart the next <laughs> Like I'll be fucked up. So I, can, I can't go down that road. He can go down. How do you feel about that? Like they're starting is to attack comedy. And comedy is the last thing that we have to really express ourselves. There's a million things to talk about. Offending people is not one of them. George Carlin, like I said, the reason I love him so much is because he found ways to say stuff without actually saying it. He right. found ways to make you think without actually telling you to think. And so with me, you know, I, when I tell my jokes, I talk through experience, but I also let you know that I'm not here to offend you. There's things I don't understand. Like I, I, when we grew up, there was no such, you couldn't see two men walking down the street. Yeah, kitchen. absolutely not. You didn't. So when I bring it to the audience, I'm letting them know, yeah, I'm talking about this, but I didn't understand it then. And now it's such a sensitive subject and, you know, everybody's getting offended. But I still want to know what makes two men attracted to each other and what, what makes a man want to dress up like a woman. Right. You know, them shoes, I, I've been with my woman. Her, her feet were uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so what makes you, you, right. you got to put on her, her shoes. Your, your feet are wider and thicker. And I know and they, they hurt. definitely don't make none for you. <laughs> no, them shit hurt. Two hour shoes. You know what I'm exactly. Why you think half of them wearing Chinese shoes on exactly. their way out the club? Them motherfuckers it's, hurt. Exactly. They slide your foot slide down on them, the bigger the heel, the higher the heel, and shit. So Make your foot slide down. So it's not being offensive. It's actually telling you I don't know. And if you got a story that you want me to learn, hey, teach me. Yeah. But it's not that serious, man. Yeah, I yeah. dig it, man. I dig it. Do you think that it's tougher for black comedians? to bust through the glass ceiling than, than any other ethnicity? No. No? No. No. I'm surprised that that response. Because that is the way they want us to think. They think that once white people approve your comedy, you made it. Mm. And you're leaving behind the people who really helped you through the struggle. Right. And I'm never, I don't care about no mainstream rooms. I don't care about no special audience, I know that I'm funny and I know that I can adapt to anybody. White people come to my shows, doesn't mean I'm gonna change my who I am. I'm still, like I, I tell in the beginning of my show, I got a filthy mouth and I'm about to curse, but curses are just words. And if you get offended and you allow me to offend you and you take it that way, oh, I'm gonna tear you to pieces. <laughs> and they think about it and they're like, wow, you're right, he's right, they're just words. Right. And that's all it is, so for, for years, they made us feel like in order for you to be successful, you have to impress us. Yeah, they, they run the... Or this person is funny now that we've said... Exactly. ...that they're funny. But when we already knew the person was funny... Yeah, exactly. And so you start to change. And when you start to change, you change who you are. And to me, no, 
I don't I don't think that way. And that's it's sad that a lot of comedians still think that way. What's the future for Capone, brother? Uh helping out young brothers. Um I'm still gonna I, continue to do the Apollo? Cause how long you been doing that oh, now? Yeah, this is actually my I'm going on 30 years. Golly. 30 years is the host of Amateur Night. Uh for four years I was actually the host of Showtime at the Apollo. Shout out to Whoopi Goldberg who helped me get that show. Um, love her to death. And um you know, the future right now is I'm able to actually put my guys on tour with my money. That's dope. That's that's what it is. That's dope. Yes. And you're here in Atlanta this whole yes. weekend. Yes, sir. At the Comedy Theater. Atlanta Comedy Theater. Make sure y'all check my man out. This is my man. One of the funniest <laughs> dudes in America. Capone. Appreciate you being Thank here, you, bro. Thank you, brother. Thank my you guy. for having me, man. My appreciate guy. It. Come on, son. Yes, I want to give you one of my books. The podcast. Right. Yes, Thank you. Sir. Look at that. Appreciate that. Team Capone, baby. We're in the building. <laughs> what up, y'all? This is Ed Lover. Did you enjoy the show? Did you enjoy it? Well, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to comment, always feel free to comment. But if you comment something that I don't like, come on, son. I'm going to get at you. I'm telling you right now. Y'all keep God first. Everything else will fall into place. I'll talk at you, with you, to you, and about you next Thursday. Be good. If you can't be good, be careful. If you can't be careful, get yourself a come on, son, sign to the next time we ride together, slide together. Laugh out loud together. Ed Lover saying God bless each and every one of y'all and thank y'all for checking us out. Until next time, give us that fuck out of here with that brother.